Hello, my name is Jonathan Havercroft, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Southampton. And I'm here to talk to you today about the Black Lives Matter movement that's been in the news the last few weeks. Um, I teach modules on protest and politics at the university. Uh, I've also published research on the Black Lives Matter movement, and uh, I'm, about, I'm about to begin a funded research project on uh, the role of rioting and violence in political protest and democracy. Um, so, the death of George Floyd. As uh, I think most of us know, the recent round of protests in the U.S. was triggered by the murder of a black man named George Floyd at the hands of the Minneapolis Police Department. Uh, there is a video shot by a, a kind of bystander on the scene that recorded George Floyd being choked to death over a period of 8 minutes and 46 seconds. And so the sharing of this video online uh, led to kind of mass national outrage. It also triggered a round of rioting and protests in the city of Minneapolis, uh, the declaration of a curfew and the mobilization of a National Guard. The protest movement has spread over the U.S. over the last two weeks, and now I think it's fairly safe to say that this is the largest period of social uprising uh, and most significant one in the U.S. since 1968. However, the Black Lives Matter movement didn't begin just two weeks ago. It's been building over the last seven years. Uh, it initially began in 2013 in response to the acquittal of this man, George Zimmerman, who was charged with the murder of Trayvon Martin, a teenage a black teenager in the state of Florida, who he had pursued, uh, who pursued on because he looked suspicious and shot and killed him. Under Florida law, there's a loophole called the Stand Your Ground law that says you're allowed to kill somebody with a gun if you fear for your life. And so Zimmerman said that he was afraid for his life, and that led to his acquittal. The outrage over his acquittal led to a social movement online, people using the hashtag Black Lives Matter to contest the ways in which black lives often are seen as not mattering, especially when it comes to uh, issues around police brutality. So the social movement is quite interesting. It's what we call in social science a hashtag movement. It's formed online through social media, unlike older kind of grassroots forms of political protest. Um, <clears throat> it's decentralized and it lacks leadership on purpose. And we can compare that to, say, the civil rights movement or uh, the anti-apartheid movement, both of which had very visible leaders. Um, the movement also uses what we call direct action, which is doing things that is essentially engaging in activities that are designed to be shocking and to confront and to force both the media and the public at large to confront an issue that they normally try to avoid. And so the key objectives of this movement, uh, what are they trying to accomplish? What are their demands? The biggest one and the most significant one is the end of police killing and police brutality in the U.S. So blacks in the U.S. are killed at a rate five times greater uh, than the rate that whites are. Over a thousand people in the U.S. are killed by police every year. Uh, if we kind of have a point of comparison, in the U.K. last year, there were four documented cases of police officers killing um, suspects or criminals. Um, Second demand is to defund police departments and redirect resources to treatment and social welfare. And so one thing to note about U.S. police departments in particular is how heavily militarized they are. They are all police officers in the U.S. carry guns, and often these police departments use um, repurposed military equipment uh, in kind of factories of policing. So part of the movement wants to redirect some of the funds from the police force to other areas of municipal budgets to deal with social welfare issues and to reduce crime rather through, through intervention rather than through policing and punishment. Third key demand is to end mass incarceration in the U.S. And so the U.S. has the largest prison population in the world, somewhere in the neighborhood of 2.3 to 2.4 million people. Again, as a point of comparison, in the U.K., the prison population is 86,000. So U.S. prison population is several order to, orders of magnitude larger than in the U.K. And finally, to remove symbols of slavery and to make reparations for slavery's continued legacy in the U.S. As the, as the Black Lives Matter movement believes that one of the key triggers of the racial injustice that we're seeing now is the long-term effects, negative effects of US's, the U.S. society's history with slavery. So what effect do these protests have? Often I hear people say that protesting doesn't work, but I think one of the things that's quite striking about this movement is how quickly it has succeeded in achieving some of its demands. So if we look at the most recent round of protests, 
Murder charges were brought right away for all four officers involved in George Floyd's death, and that's actually quite rare in the U.S. Um, there was an, a commitment 10 days later by the Minneapolis City Council to disband and replace the Minneapolis Police Department with something that was more fit for purpose. The commissioner of the Minneapolis Police Department agreed to re review all the policies surrounding the use of force by the officers in the department and also to look at policies in terms of how officers are sanctioned. So one of the officers involved in George Floyd's death had actually had 14 different complaints placed against them, but had never had any sanctions for previous violent activities. And finally, it's led to a very rapid national shift in attitudes around race and policing in the U.S. So we can just look at this graph here. When the Black Lives Matter movement started, it was extremely unpopular, but its support has built over the last seven years. And you can see a very rapid increase since the rise of this latest round of protest, where now the Black Lives Matter movement is probably one of the more popular social movements in the U.S. So the key message to take away from all of this is that mass protest movements work. In fact, a lot of the different rights and uh, liberties that we have today are the direct result of mass protest movements, and most of them, when they began, were extremely unpopular. So in UK history, the Chartist movement of the 19th century expanded the franchise and reformed British democracy. The suffragettes in the early 20th century won women the right to vote. Gandhi led a mass protest movement in the 1940s that won India independence. The civil rights movement in the U.S. ended segregation, and Nelson Mandela and the ANC movement in South Africa ended apartheid. The current hashtag movements link older forms of mass protest with social media to bring about democratic change. So in many ways, they're simply building on this longstanding crucial role that mass social protest movements have in improving uh, our democracy. Thank you very much.